Deputy Speaker, those great philosophers Jagger and Richards wrote and sang in 1965, I can't get no satisfaction. Australian voters might be reminding themselves of this today as they consider the disappointment known as the Abbott government. This is a government defined by disappointment, deceit and incompetence. The opposition leader who promised so much has morphed into a confused Prime Minister, a man rapidly sinking into the quicksand of his own negativity. Not only can he not lead the nation, he cannot even lead his own government, which is desperately split on policy and political direction and crippled by internal power struggles. The source of this government's dysfunction is the cynical opportunism of its period in opposition. Most parties in opposition focus on holding governments to account and rebuilding their credibility by developing new ideas. That's what Dan Andrews did in Victoria over the past few years. He made himself a participant in the battle of ideas and now he is Premier of Victoria. When the Abbott government was in opposition, its only focus was attacking the former Labor government. As opposition leader, the Prime Minister transformed the coalition into the Noalition, building his entire case for power on anti-Labor hatred and three-word slogans. Everything about politics and nothing about policy. That's why the Tories have retreated to their comfort zone today. Without positive ideas, they've been forced to lean heavily on Tony Abbott's regressive and punitive personal ideology, one that values individualism ahead of equity and opportunity. The Prime Minister's negativity did make him a formidable opposition leader, but they make him a pretty bad Prime Minister. We now see that negativity is all he ever had. It is his only weapon. He is a one-trick Tony. You can't win the battle of ideas if you have no ideas. You can't run an economy on three-word slogans. You don't create jobs by saying no to everything, and you don't inspire people by misleading them. Before the election, the Prime Minister promised no cuts to health, education, pensions, the ABC or SBS. He promised no new taxes. In government, he has cut $80 billion from health and education, slashed funding for the ABC and SBS, and created new taxes whenever people visit a GP or fill up their car at the petrol bowser. Rubbing salt into the wounds, he has since insulted the electorate's intelligence with Monty Python-esque claims that he hasn't broken any promises. The Prime Minister is on the wrong side of history. His place defined not by leadership and forward thinking, but by a sad yearning for a less equal and less progressive past. A place where average Australians pay a Medicare levy every week, only to be told they have to pay again to visit a doctor. A place where education is about entrenching privilege, not spreading opportunity, where climate science is derided and where a visiting US president's praise for the splendour of the Great Barrier Reef is attacked by those opposite as an affront to our national sovereignty. It's a place where our renewable energy target has been so successful that it has to be scrapped, where we have only one woman in the cabinet, where radio shock jocks and partisan newspaper columnists set the government's political agenda. Where bigotry is a right. Where people communicate over ageing copper wire rather than 21st century fibre. A place where the long faded trappings of our colonial past are revived through the reintroduction of the British honours system. The Abbott government has misread the egalitarian nature of Australian culture. Australians care about the fair go. Part of what defines us is a generosity of spirit, one that embraces a sense of community and common interest. Australians support measures to improve the budget, but they aren't stupid. They know that when a single income family on $65,000 a year will be $6,000 a year worse off every year, while corporate tax cheats are a protected species, budget repair is being used as a cover for an ideological agenda. They know that a budget that was truly under emergency conditions wouldn't be promoting a paid parental leave scheme that will have an ongoing impact on the budget of $5 billion a year 
and more into the future. The 2014 budget was not a plan for the future, but an attack on the gains of the past. Australians know it is unfair and they're demanding better. In my own area of infrastructure, the Prime Minister has treated his election promises like plates at a Greek wedding. The government said it would preserve the independence of Infrastructure Australia. What they have done is to try to remove that independence through legislation. An attempt abandoned only after pressure from Labor and business groups, including the Business Council of Australia, Infrastructure, uh, Infrastructure Partnerships Australia and indeed Infrastructure Australia itself. They said they'd reappoint Sir Rod Eddington as the Chairman of Infrastructure Australia, but they appointed a former Liberal Party minister instead. They said they would not invest in infrastructure without cost-benefit analysis to ensure value for money. Then they took money from Infrastructure Australia priority projects that had had cost-benefit analysis and reallocated it to the East West Link, West Connects and a Perth Freight Link. They said there would be cranes and bulldozers at work on new projects within 12 months of their election, but there are no bulldozers, just bulldust. They said they would pay money to states for infrastructure projects in stages based on the achievements of milestones. Then they gave the Victorian government a $1.5 billion advance payment for the East West Link project, a project that has not commenced construction. They pretend they're investing in new infrastructure, but they continue to travel the nation on a magical infrastructure reannouncement tour, seeking ownership of existing projects funded by the previous Labor government. This deceit has reached absurd levels with the renaming of projects. Labor's F3 to M2 project became North Connects, while Western Australia's Swan Valley Bypass became Northlink. Renaming a project does not make it new. Worst of all, the few new road projects in the budget are being funded by cuts to all Commonwealth investment in public transport projects not under construction. This is what the Prime Minister said in his uh, manifesto battle lines. He wrote this, mostly there just aren't enough people wanting to go from a particular place to a particular destination at a particular time to justify any vehicle larger than a road and cars need roads. An absurd proposition for any national leader to make in 2014. I don't remember a more cringeworthy moment than when he had an opportunity to speak to the world's leaders about a vision for the future at the recent G20 meeting in Brisbane. Mr Abbott's contribution involved whinging about Australians not supporting his GP tax and proudly declaring he had removed a price on carbon. There is no issue too big for Tony Abbott to show how small he is. But I've got news for the Prime Minister. Serious world leaders want to act on climate change. Serious world leaders see our system of universal health care as something to be envied. The problem isn't that Tony Abbott is stuck in the past. It's that he wants the rest of Australia to go back there and keep him company. Prior to the election, the coalition insisted it would provide adult government. But there's nothing adult about a government that has spent an entire year attacking the Labor Party and devoted no time to actually governing. There's nothing adult about a parliament that is run on partisan lines. There's nothing adult about having an assistant treasurer, Arthur Sinodinus, who sits on the sidelines on the basis that he is only incompetent, which is the best possible scenario that you can make from the events that occurred in New South Wales. Australians are sick of the negativity that this government has brought to national political debate. They want a government to focus on what really matters them. Jobs, access to health care, equity of opportunity through access to education, cities that are productive, sustainable and liveable, healthy communities that value diversity, an integrated transport system that includes both public transport and roads. Above all, Australians want a government that governs in accordance with Australian values, like that of the fair go. This might come as news to some of those opposite, but all, not all values have a dollar sign in front of them. This is a government characterised by opposition to anything public. Education, opposition to public health, public transport, public broadcasters, public housing. The theme is they don't like the public, 
but the public will certainly get a say come 2016. 